Hello, welcome to Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Kate Harper of the 61st District in Montgomery County. Recently, I participated in a House Consumer Affairs Committee meeting to discuss problems which occurred in May when the Pennsylvania American Water Company had to briefly shut down part of the water system that supplies part of Montgomery County with water. At the hearing, we heard from Pennsylvania American's president, Kathy Pape, and had the opportunity to find out what happened. As legislators, it's important for us to understand how an event like this affects residents and businesses alike and what can be done in the future to avoid water shutoffs. On today's program, we will see portions of this important hearing. As you're aware, the Norristown Water Treatment Plant serves over 31,000 customers in the Norristown area, specifically in East Narden, West Narden, Lower Providence, Whitpain, Worcester, and White Marsh Townships. But that reach is much greater as many of the local businesses impacted by this issue employ people from the greater Philadelphia region. Many of our local businesses, especially locally owned restaurants and delis, had no choice but to close their doors due to the lack of quality drinking water for food preparation. Many of these businesses who are locally owned and operated by residents who live within our townships Needless to say, the impact of this issue hit them much harder than the larger chain-owned restaurants that had the resources available to bring in potable water that meets the standards and requirements set by the Montgomery County Health Department. Due to the large service area impacted by the loss of water and the extended period of time, finding water tanks became a stressful endeavor for our business owners. Over the course of this event, the township received numerous calls from residents voicing their frustration with the length of the boil water advisory and the impact it had on their daily lives. Several residents expressed their frustration over not receiving the automated calls regarding the Boral Water Advisory and conflicting information that they received. It has been noted that the problem surfaced on Tuesday, May 20th, when water quality inspectors at the Norristown plant determined that heavy rainfall totals throughout the month had churned up sediment in the source water of the Schuylkill River near the Norristown Water Treatment Plant. This caused dramatically lowered capacity and an effective, and, and effective water shortage. Prior to May 20th, the Norristown area received roughly seven inches of rain for the month of May. Beginning on April 30th and ending May 1st, West Norrington Township experienced heavy rainfall and major flooding in the Port Indian section of the township. During this period, roughly 4.8 in inches of rain had fallen in the area, and we experienced the fourth highest cresting of the Schuylkill River on record at 20.8 feet. Also during this time, the Army Corps of Engineers authorized the release of water from the Blue Marsh Dam located upstream from West Norrington. It is our belief that this release of water from the dam upstream increased the water levels in the Schuylkill River. Initial forecast had the Schuylkill River cresting at 14 feet, which would be at minor flood stage for the township. The heavy rainfall coupled with the dam release caused the forecast to increase to 21 feet, thus exceeding the major flooding stage. Um, coupled with that, uh, West Arden Township recently completed an inflow and infiltration study for our sanitary sewer system. As part of this study, the township installed flow meters into our sanitary sewer system to monitor flow. Two storms of significance were analyzed as part of this report, June 7, 2013 and July 23, 2013. The storm of June 7, 2013 lasted 24 hours and West Arden received between 3 to 4 inches of rainfall. This amount of rainfall would represent a two-year storm based on the latest NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration Point Precipitation Frequency Estimates. The storm of July 23, 2013 was very short, high intensive event lasting two hours. West Norrington received 1.6 inches of rain and this rainfall would amount, would represent another two year storm based on the NOAA point precipitation frequency estimates. During the events of Superstorm Sandy, West Norrington and the surrounding areas were hit with heavy rainfalls <clears throat> and winds that impacted the Schuylkill River. When the snow melted from this past winter's harsh weather and the Schuylkill River iced over from the cold temperatures, significant water runoff made its way to the Schuylkill River. During these periods, we received no notification that, West Nar that the Norristown Water Treatment Plant was experiencing water quality issues. In my previous position, I served as the manager of the borough of Pottstown. In this capacity, I also served as the authority manager for the Pottstown Authority. This authority operates a water plant that produces an average of 4.5 million gallons of water per day for roughly 12,000 customers. The plant also uses the Schuylkill River as a sole source of raw water for processing. During my time as authority manager, I cannot recall a storm event or heavy rainfall that impacted the long-term operation of the plant. While most plants have operational procedures for tropical storms or heavy rain events, the rainfalls that impacted the Norristown plant occurred prior to the boil water advisory. The most significant rainfall prior to the issuance of the boil water advisory occurred on May 17th, three days prior. 
In my discussions with area managers, the Norristown Water Treatment Plant was the only plant that uses the Schuylkill River as a sole source, sole source of raw water to experience an issue with the water quality due to heavy rainfall. A question has been asked over and over again is how did this happen and what can be done to prevent an issue like this again? I do applaud PA American's response when the issue was discovered. The daily conference calls and support received from their staff were remarkable. While no one can, fault, can find fault with their response, the question remains as to why this happened. Again, on behalf of the residents of West Iron Township, I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me the opportunity to testify on this critical issue. Uh, Representative Harper. Thank you, Chairman Gottschall. Were you satisfied with the communications between uh, your township and the water customers and the company before, during, and after the event? Yes. I mean, the only issue we faced is obviously with, with telephone numbers. A lot of the residents were complaining they didn't get the, the, the automated phone calls. Um, so we tried to share as much information on our website that we got. We had the daily conference calls. Um, like I said in my testimony, we were definitely pleased with the response after the fact. I think the bigger question is why it, did it happen? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Pennsylvania Safe Drinking Water Regulations require that public water suppliers shall take whatever investigative or corrective action is necessary to assure that safe and potable water is continuously supplied to the users. When there are circumstances which may adversely affect the quality or quantity of positive water pressure in any portion of the distribution system, there is evidence of contamination or a water supplier suspects a high risk of contamination, a public water supplier is required to report the circumstances to the department within one hour of that discovery. In the case of one of these events, DEP has a policy in place to require the public water supplier to provide public notice as soon as possible, but no later than 24 hours after the water supplier learns of the situation. The policy provides procedures to ensure water supplies are safe for potable use during a loss of positive pressure situation and after pressure is restored. The notice requires a boil water advisory, a BWA, as a public notice that directs consumers to boil their water or use an alternate source of drinking water. Boiling water is recommended to inactivate or destroy pathogens that may be in contaminated water. In order to lift a BWA, a public water supplier must accomplish the following. One, complete the necessary corrective actions. Two, flush the lines or storage tanks. And three, obtain satisfactory lab results on two consecutive days. From the morning of Tuesday, May 20th through Friday, May 23rd, DEP staff from the Southeast Regional Office was in frequent contact with PA American monitoring their response to the treatment upset at the Norristown <coughs> treatment plant. On Friday, May 23rd, DEP received sample results from PA American. The results that DEP received shortly before noon on Friday, May 23rd, were samples that were taken on Wednesday, May 21st, 21st and Thursday, May 22nd. The sample results indicated the absence of bacteria in the finished water and in the distribution system. From DEP's perspective, PA American followed DEP's policies and regulations during this incident. I again thank you. I thank the committee for allowing me the opportunity to provide testimony and would be happy to answer any questions. You thought that Pennsylvania America followed the requirements of your department, right? Correct, yes. Some of the complaints I heard, ironically, were about turning the water back on. So in your testimony, you said they had to do two days of tests. Correct. They did them Wednesday and Thursday, and you found out Friday. But I recall a lot of distress among people about when will the water be back on? When can we reopen our restaurants? When is this going to end? Are your regulations consistent with science? Can you do it any faster? If they tested it Thursday and it was fine, why didn't you put the water back it, on it on Thursday? Two, it takes two consecutive days so, you know, of testing per our regulations, and they followed that, and that's the protocol they needed to follow. Once on the third day, once we get those samples back and they were deemed clean, then we can allow them to lift the advisory. Right. I mean, that sounds like a good idea to me. I'm, I'm not a scientist in this field as you are. I guess what I'm saying is the distress I heard was, you know, about turning the water back on. Is there any way that the regulations could be, you know, changed or fixed to make it easier to say, okay, it's really okay, turn it back on right now? I wouldn't be able to really comment on that, Representative, at this okay. point. That's something that I can bring back to uh, Harrisburg Central Office and uh, see what answer we can get back to you on. All right, great. Thank you. 
I want to make one imp important point clear, and I've seen the issue raised already with the uh, prior presenters. Water quality, uh, leaving the plant, uh, was at no time compromised. So at no time during the event um, was there any violation of water quality regulations. I heard a mention of some dark water, some brown water, and that might have occurred um, on or about the same time, but it wasn't caused by the issue at the plant. There could have been a main break somewhere that caused brown water. Um, what occurred at the plant was a quantity issue, not a quality issue. If you think of the uh, rain events that occurred, and I'll talk about those in a couple minutes, um, if you think about the Schuylkill River as you might think about a stream, and if you took a stick, into a, put it into a stream, and you stirred the stream up, all the sediment that would rise up is the same thing that happens when rain falls, when heavy rain falls into a stream or into the river. So we call it tur uh, turbidity, but it's cloudiness, it's junk, it's gunk, and what happened is uh, our filters were plugged with all the sediment, all the turbidity that occurred um, on the river. That turbidity plugged the filter, think of a screen, plugged the, the filters, and water could not get through. Um, ultimately, the precautionary boil water advisory was caused by the fact that we had uh, zero or negative pressure in parts of the system. I'd like to address and kind of deviate from my prepared remarks to address the question that seemed to be raised uh, by several members of the committee, and that is, why did it occur at this water treatment plant and not at other uh, plants along the Schuylkill? We draw from the Schuylkill, um, but we are a zero discharge plant, what's known as a zero discharge plant. So although we take water from the Schuylkill River, um, we do not put any water back into the river. We don't put solids and we don't put liquids back into the river. We don't have a permit to put water, anything back into the river. Um, it's an environmentally responsible way to treat water. We're the only zero discharge plant along the Schuylkill River. So the city of Philadelphia, uh, many people, many customers ask us that question during the event. Why aren't they having any issue? Well, they have a discharge permit, an MPDES permit, so they can discharge to the river. So can Pottstown and also Phoenixville have plants that have discharge permits. So does Aqua, Pennsylvania. They draw from the Schuylkill River, um, but they are permitted to uh, put their residuals comes off after the treatment process back into the river. Somebody had suggested that perhaps we could have uh, received an emergency permit from DEP during the event. Well, we could perhaps have done that, but we don't have piping. Um, if there's piping, of, you have to have piping from the treatment plant to the river if you're going to put your residuals back into the river. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking at um, as part of our after action report, should we have in place an MPDES permit from DEP uh, that would permit us in an emergency situation to put residuals back into the water. The, um, the rain events that occurred in May, um, the, the first event which occurred at the end of April, April 30 to May 1, and I know um, that many of you are aware in West Norton because um, I was aware of some of the flooding that occurred in West Norton at the time. Um, but that event put down seven inches of water in a very short period of time. And the, the Schuylkill River cr crested at 20.83 feet. That's the highest crest other than Agnes in 72, Floyd in 99, and the um, Chesapeake Potomac hurricane in, in 1933. So it was a significant amount of water. Also, the second event occurred May 10, 11. Uh, less than an inch came down at that point. But then on May 16, uh, we had an additional 1.6 inches of rain. So all of that, as I described before, stirred up the Schuylkill River. And so the uh, sediment, the turbidity that was in the river, was then pulled into the plant and uh, clogged the filter. So water could not get through to get out into the distribution system. 
the plant actually shut down automatically a couple times because water couldn't move through the filters and into the system. So early on, the, the night of May 19, we contacted the PUC and DEP, which is the protocol when an issue is occurring, because we wanted to issue a um, mandatory conservation order. We knew we weren't going to be able to push uh, production capacity through uh, to meet the demand on the system. So of course, we, we asked customers, please only use water for essential purposes. By the time uh, the kids came home from school on the 20th and people came home from work, we had several tanks that went dry. At that point, once you have tanks dry and you get no water calls, you then have uh, zero or negative pressure in parts of the system. So the mandatory conservation order went to 11 townships or boroughs uh, in the area because we wanted everybody to conserve. However, the zero or negative pressure didn't occur in the entire system. It only occurred in six municipalities. I want to, if I remember them correctly, it was East and West Norton, Lower Providence, White Marsh, Whitpain, and um, Worcester townships. So many customers said, so why did I get a mandatory conservation call, but I, didn't, uh, I did not get the precautionary boil water advisory. And that was because we wanted everybody to conserve, but not everybody had to have the precautionary boil water advisory because not all areas had zero pressure. So the water quality leaving the plant was never compromised. It never um, was, we, we were never in a situation where it didn't meet all DEP and EPA water quality regulations. But when we issued uh, the precautionary boil water advisory, um, that was because if you have negative or zero pressure, there's a potential for bacteria getting into the system. There was never any indication that there was bacteria in the system, but the protocol, the regulations of DEP say if you have negative pressure, zero pressure, you have to go to a precautionary boil water advisory. During the night of May 20 into May 21, our uh, plant staff backwashed the filters over and over. And if you think of the filter as a screen and you think of it in layman's terms as being gummed up, backwashing pushes water through at high pressure in the opposite direction to get the gunk and the stuff, the sediment, out of the filter. So our staff worked overnight, and by the morning of May 21, operationally, the issue was over. Our tanks were refilling. The system was back in service. But when you issue a precautionary boil water advisory, you just don't snap your fingers, and then it's over. Once that precautionary boil water advisory was issued, in order to lift it, we had to con conduct bacteria testing in various sites, and we did 11 sites in the system. Those um, tests have to be done. They have to come back negative. Uh, and um, I'll address Representative Harper's question because this is, like, uh, this is like science class. The tests are done. The bacteria, ha you have to wait for it to grow. It's like a Petri dish. And I have asked the same question that you asked. Come on, we're in a computerized world. Why do we have to wait so long? But it takes the, the technology as it exists right now, and I believe our staff um, at American Water has the best understanding there is. If there was a faster way to do it, we would. So you have to do the test. Then you have to wait for the test to come back. Then you have to do a second test. And um, as impatient as I am, I have asked, so why don't you do one at 11.59 and one at 12.01 if uh, you have to do it in two different days? The tests have to be 12 hours apart. Once you get that second test, you do the test, then you have to get the results back. So that's what caused the time to elapse between the 21st and the 23rd 
when all tests came back negative, there was no bacteria in the system, uh, but on the 23rd, we then consulted with DEP and we were able to lift the precautionary boil water advisory. The communication efforts uh, during these type of events are important, so I just wanted to touch on what we did and how we did it. Uh, during each of the three, I'll call them steps, we issued the mandatory conservation notice, we issued a precautionary boil water advisory, and we also lifted that advisory. In each of those circumstances, we used our auto dialer. Um, and we're required to do that. So we sent outbound calls to, in the initial circumstance, the uh, mandatory water conservation notice. We sent that auto dialer to all 31,000 customers. When we issued the precautionary boil water advisory, it went to 18,600 customers in those six townships that I mentioned. Uh, we also, um, worked with um, a group, a, t a team of our employees, um, physically called all of our critical customers, 400 of them in those six communities, and that would be healthcare facilities, daycare centers, dialysis um, centers, uh, restaurants, to notify them and to do it more quickly than the auto dialer might um, do. We also wanted to be sure that the word was spread, so we issued press releases to um, the Philadelphia and the Norristown media outlets. Additionally, we used our Facebook page and our social media sites. And importantly, the social media sites were, were very helpful because um, not only did it get the news out, what customers uh, needed to do, what was going on, what steps we were taking, where the water tankers were located, where they could get bottled water, where they could get potable water that wasn't in a bottle. Uh, but the um, local municipalities in the area and also the county used that information from our site uh, and then the information was retweeted um, on their sites as well. So in particular, Montgomery County was very helpful in using their social media sites to get the information out to the public. We also uh, hosted daily conference calls on the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd for legislators, municipal officials, the fire departments, and the emergency uh, services personnel. And it was good to have real-time information exchanged to answer questions uh, that were arising over time so that local officials and legislators could answer their constituent calls. In terms of root causes, the, uh, the very uh, nugget um, root cause was the high turbidity on the Schuylkill River um, that plugged the filters. Uh, the backwashing of the filters um, was not enough uh, we couldn't get to a state initially to produce enough water to meet the demands in the system. We also, uh, when we know we might have high residuals, we truck some of the liquids away from the plant in tankers, and we were doing that at this point also, but we couldn't truck it away fast enough. We couldn't truck those liquid residuals away because it was such a significant amount of residuals because of the rain events. We talked about um, why it was our plant and not others. We talked about the MPDES permit. Um, I'd like to talk just for a couple minutes about our short-term um, solutions and our long-term solutions, or at least potential solutions. Initially, we looked at our standard operating procedures at the plant to look at what could we have done differently that might have helped. So as of last week, um, we've changed operating procedures related to managing the clarifier at the plant and the thickener levels. Um, we also looked at what are our protocols for removing a unit from service. And finally, we looked at changes in protocols for trucking liquids away from the plant. It seems from the testifiers we've had this morning that once the incident occurred, things were handled in accordance with law and regulations and pretty much as they should have been handled but it was still a very distressing experience for the, the people 
um, who, you know, got the boil water advisories and couldn't operate their businesses or who were afraid to take showers or whatever, you know. So I guess my question is going back to how it started, how we could prevent it from happening again. And I see that you're taking steps. I'm wondering how significant is it that clarifier number two was out of commission when all this happened? How long does it take to fix a clarifier? And is there any way you could have um, put it back into service when you saw the weather reports? I mean, I just want to know, what could we do to stop this from happening? Yeah, there was an arm in the bottom of the clarifier that um, needed to be repaired. Um, so uh, it, it, you know, once you start repairs, um, putting it back in service when the weatherman, you know, changes uh, the weather forecast uh, isn't easy. But certainly um, having that clarifier out of service at that point in time um, didn't help the situation. And that's why we want to look at the capacity of the clarifier so that perhaps uh, one could have handled something like this if they were both larger. Also looking at exactly uh, when you do your repairs. Uh, right. Perhaps um, uh, the uh, times of the year when maybe you wouldn't be using as much water, but you know there's never really any good time. The win you can't couldn't do it in the winter, and we had such a long hard winter. So I trust our uh, local folks uh, that they they didn't do it. Oh, let's pick when we're going to get some heavy rainfalls because certainly when you get into August and September, that's when you could have hurricane effects, so you wouldn't pick that time. So we'll, we'll look at that, but certainly um, having that out of service didn't help. I'm sure there are many reasons why people would experience brown water. And it, could that have been affected, could, could that have been caused by the low pressure? I don't think it would have been caused by low pressure but we'll get an answer on the or brown water. Or varying pressure, you know, that, that stirred up sediment in the pipes or in the house or whatever. I mean, that, there should be some system whereby your company recognizes the complaint and figures out the reason, particularly if there's no main break, which would be the most likely reason. Right. Any, any change in, I'll call velocity through the pipes, could affect... Anything that stirs up the sediment in the bottom of the pipes, it's, I mean, it's there all the time. Uh, but we'll look at it, and um, we'll address how we get that word out to the community. Because if that's the primary concern, and I apologize, had I known that, I would have come here with an answer on brown water. Uh, but if that's the concern, that's what we need to address. And it's, it doesn't matter if it's perception. We say we know the water is fine, even though it's brown. But from a customer's point of view, if you don't want chocolate milk, um, you know, you're drinking water, you want it to be clear. So I agree with that. We'll get an answer on the brown water and why, um, and it, it, have a communication with our customers so they, they understand, and then they can decide. Well, I, I a agree that, I mean, if you're saying that the water leaving the plant was fine, that's really good news. But if it's coming out your tap and it's not fine, that's really bad news. So we want to be reassured that Pennsylvania American Water uh, is getting these complaints, taking them seriously, and trying to figure out what is going on and trying to prevent it from happening again. It does seem like you handled it correctly when it did happen, but I think it was nonetheless a, a distressing situation. Well, Representative Harper, let me make it clear that it, we don't just test the water when it came out of the plant. When okay. we did those bacteria tests, we did them at 11 sites, and they're not all clustered around the plant. Um, and those were out in the system uh, that was affected. So we felt comfortable. We did, you know, the two tests, and all of them came back negative. But, so in the system, we felt comfortable that okay. the water at the tap was fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Kate Harper. If you would like to see this meeting in its entirety, please visit my website. Click on the video button. But if you need assistance with any state government matter, feel free to contact me at my local office. The address and phone number will be shown in just a moment. Thanks for watching. Please join me next time for Legislative Report.